Welcome to What Are You Sporting About podcast, a podcast about business, employment, sports, and entertainment to help educate, support, and guide you to your next level. Here's your host, attorney Savania DeBarros. Hello, hello, everybody. I'm Savannah DeBarros, a protector of athletes and the host of the What Are You Sporting About podcast. Super excited to be here with you all today because I have a, a special guest for you and I can't wait to dive in. But before we do, hey, I got to remind you, make sure that you go and get your ticket right now for our upcoming NIL Combine Live event. Tickets are on sale right now and we're in the early bird stage. So you want to go ahead and copy your seat, copy your ticket right now while the opportunity is present. Do not buy 2023. Again, go ahead right now, RSVP at bit.ly, NIL Combine 2023. Make sure NIL Combine is in all caps so you do not miss any opportunity. So today I have the opportunity to bring another amazing woman in business before you guys for Women's History Month. So last week, I talked a lot about women entrepreneurs and how we're taking up space. In fact, we are representing a large body or percentage of individuals that are going into entrepreneurship and Black women especially has increased those numbers since COVID-19. So I wanted to make sure that I brought someone else um, before you that can really shed some light on their journey and some of the, the issues that we might face as women in corporate America, America, in business, but it doesn't have to be so difficult, right? We all have our own particular gifts that, and purposes, of course, that we're working on um, and that can also support us as we show up for other people. So without further ado, I want to welcome attorney Shakita Hall Jackson to the stage. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm super excited as well. This is so fun to have you. We met previously at an event and of course, we're both sisters in the law <laughs> and both kind of do some similar things as it relates to employment stuff. But before I dive in, I want to just kind of tell people a little bit about who you are, because I know that you are an agent for change and you do show up in uh, several different spaces to champion for individuals. So why don't you give us a little bit of a, of a background story about how you got to where you are now? Sounds good. Um, so once again, hi, everyone. I'm Shakita Hall Jackson of litigation. I started off with family law, criminal law, and a few other things. I just did not enjoy those areas. And then ultimately, I had a friend from college reach out to me and ask that I represent her father in an OSHA hearing, um, which is essentially a fancy word for administrative trial. And from there, I had another colleague, her aunt was being sexually harassed at work to a point where she wanted to cut her face. Um, and she was placed in a 14-day treatment facility for mental health. Um, because it had got the workplace I got that toxic. And it was just working with those cases. I felt like I was in my purpose. I felt like I was actually making a change and I felt good about the work that I was doing. And as a result, um, it resonated with my past work experience of just wanting to go to work, <laughs> um, impress the boss enough to get a raise, have a nice performance review and make a living to get the things that I wanted. However, you know, the biases that um, comes along with corporate America, especially in law firms and things like that. So I feel like this is where God placed me at and my experiences uh, will help me be passionate and advocate on behalf of my clients. And to this day, that's what I wake up um, and go late, <laughs> sleep late at night, <laughs> go to bed late at night fighting for. Now, that's really good. So one thing that you talk about is being on the receiving end of certain gender and race discrimination. I think we've all have felt that in some way, shape or form, and especially as a black woman in America, it's almost, um, what is the terminology for? <laughs> it's like, it just comes with being here. <laughs> right? it's, I hate to say it, but it, you know, it truly is what it is. So especially as a woman also in business and a woman in business for herself, there could be challenges that um, we face that other people may not face. So how did you overcome 
those um, sexual gender or sex gender uh, race discrimination issues. And I think we've kind of heard a little bit of how that has helped you to be a force to serve other people uh, in the employment space in, in, in other ways. But how has it helped you to grow and develop as a woman and as an attorney fighting for other people who may be experiencing what you what you once did? I think, honestly, when it comes into the race, like you said, I feel like we are born with this. It's just something that's going to be a part of our identity as we matriculate through life. Um, However, I really want to give credit to becoming a mom. Um, Prior, I've been becoming a mom until my late 30s. Um, But prior to that, I had a mission and every year I had a goal. And once I got pregnant and after I had my baby, I'm like, I'm not leading this way anymore. God, I want you to show me what do you want me to do next. And within saying that, um, as I see my daughter, I would hate for her to go through the biases that I went through. Um, So I want to be able to get in front of her and try to build those relationships and go interrupt what we have known corporate cultures to look like, what we have known workplaces, what is the norm in workplaces. You know, I remember representing one um, fella he worked um, in the construction industry and the link, I brought a defamation of character case on his um, behalf. And the response, um, even into interrogatory response was, this is shop talk. This is how they talk. You know, this is how everyday communication sound like. And so there is no defamation here, unfortunately. And I'm like, no, just because it had been done this way for years, doesn't mean that people should be subjected to it daily. Um, when they simply just come to make a living. <laughs> and it's so crazy that people fail to realize that we, we are here to make a living and provide for our family. If friendships develop, then they develop. But I should not be subjected to harsh and unfair working treatments just because I'm your employee. Um, and so, like I said, the motherhood as to I need to try to get outside of my comfort zone and think bigger than a verdict, think bigger, bigger than a settlement, And how can I be a change agent to make sure that by the time she's going to interns and actually finish her education and going to um, a career, that she's not subjected to the same toxic work environments and disrupting behaviors that I was subjected to? Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, And I I think also becoming a parent... (laughs) There's a lot to be said about that. Now, we do know that evidence exists of people that become parents and still something. I don't know what's not clicking, but uh, but for me and for you, it seems as though becoming a parent also provided or unlocked another ideal or way of thinking, way of approaching certain issues. And then we also think more long term. Is this the society that we would want to bring our children up in, but the reason why we continuously have business on the employment sector is because there are other people that they've been living or doing things in a particular way. They think that it might be okay. And how does that impact the overall community? Because when you think about an individual who goes to work, they want to enjoy their work, Uh, They want to also make a living. The point of them working is so that they can Mm -hmm. hopefully provide for the family that they're, you know, um, that that lives with them and that they've had. And so if there are these other barriers and environmental issues and cultural issues, which I'm not speaking of culture in, in the sense of you came from a different place or your family's religious culture is X, Y, and Z, but the culture of the company that is so uncomfortable for people, um, it can have a trickle effect to the employee's home life, Mm. you know, Um, where, and, and I don't think a lot of people really see how the way that they build and foster certain cultures in the corporate space, how it trickles into people's home lives. It trickles into their uh, medical issues, right? So I, I think the that- I can add to that. Yeah, I, 
That is so very much true. And that's why I said I gave kudos to my daughter and credit to, um, because I always say, I am a black person before I'm a woman. Ultimately, we equal, right? But before you recognize me as a woman in the space, most people gonna fear me because I'm black, or most people gonna treat me the way I am because I'm black, not necessarily because I'm a woman. Um, women history is here. Women history month is here. Um, Susan B. Anthony started something, but have I feel like we have progressed so much as women that we're still so behind as black people. However, with that being said, and going back to what you were stating, I that's one of the main things that I am trying to protect my child from the idea of that she has to now go check herself into a 14 to 21 day because that's not the first client that i had i have multiple clients that have to check this and it's simply because of a work environment you go through their medical documentation there is no history of anything that's going on in the household um no prior evidence of depression anxiety these people are being heavily medicated being put into place simply because they were going to work trying to make a living and someone is allowing this, because this is not nine times out of 10, if I'm going to report my supervisor, someone in human resources, whoever, this is not the first complaint. These are usually multiple complaints and someone is brushing it under the rug um, and they just don't care. And it does boil over. It's causing divorces. It's causing, I had one client, her child flunked first grade because she simply couldn't get out the bed to take care of her child because of the effects of the workplace. So it is very much real, and that's what needs to be disrupted. No, that is a really good point. Really, really, really good point. And I think that's why we stay in business. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, people are comfortable with these unhealthy work environments, and they don't see how damaging it is until it hits that corporation's pockets. And some of them, they're just willing to settle to make it go away. But at the end of the day, let's say if you are that small business owner and you have scaled to multi seven figures, maybe even eight figures, you have to recognize what culture, like what environment am I creating, company culture am I creating that might not be conducive to the overall health and growth of the people who work for us. So even if we looked at it from this perspective of just being a black owned company. So in the black community, we have certain cultures where we might do or say certain things that is a cultural proverb or we understand it to be a certain way. But what if that culture ended up offending someone else that mm -hmm. now is working for that company? So I think I think we have to always be on notice yes. to recognize and value other perspectives and other individual people's cultures so that we can create a working environment that is safe that is healthy, that is seemingly fun, because if people yes. have fun, they'll stay. Yes. You know, they'll stay. Yes. There's, a, there's a, a study I think I ran across a while ago that talked about how much turnover really hits the bottom line of a company's mm -hmm. pockets, their pocketbooks. So if you got a lot of turnover, especially as a mid to large size company, there might be some underlying issues there that I feel companies might not be addressing. And maybe they, they'll they be forced to address it later when that one employee who refuses to quit decides to sue them. And you know what? A lot of times what I find is it's the relationships. I know Bob. I know his family. He's going through a tough time. Um, he probably didn't mean it. I'm going to go talk to him type thing. Or he is our number one producer and I can't afford to let him go type thing. So we just pay out lawsuits versus dealing with his actions. And I haven't seen it time and time again. And it's just that raw. I'm like, if we ask, the EEOC asks, if I my firm asks an interrogatory, how many um, discrimination claims have you had against this company, against this particular supervisor within the last five years, two years, three years, and they're turning over paperwork this thick to show that there's a nice amount of discrimination claims, yet the key decision maker, the actor, the wrongdoer is still in the workplace. You start to do you believe that it's time to move that person or terminate that person? Um, and like I said, a lot of times it's just simply relationships. And like you said, there is a budget scheduled 
whatever quarter at the end of the year, uh, quarter three, when we go in July and talk about everything uh, for next year, we're putting that money in there for those legal, um, those lawsuits. And so at the end of the day, it's just another dollar for them. And there is no need or desire, I shall say. There's definitely a need. There's no desire or want to want to interrupt those behaviors. And once again, it goes back to, this is my buddy. My wife and his wife are good together. Our children go to school together. And I know what his overhead looks like if he loses his job, what that do. You know, however, when it comes to the discrimination sector, I have a same situation with African-American man who he's going through something. He did something that he completely, he just wasn't on his P's and Q's. Do the same wrongdoing or somewhat similar. Um, and he's has he don't even get a warning. It's not even a suspension. There's no progressive discipline, not a PIP or anything. It's strictly out the door. And at no point did anyone care about what he was going through, what was going on in his household, and how this is going to mess his mental, mess up his family dynamic, all that. And so it is, it's very much real. No, that's, that is definitely the truth. So I know we've been like tossing around some legal uh, terminologies for us. So for all of you guys that are out there listening, whether you're watching this live right now or you're you're watching later or listening later, um, when we talk about the discovery process, that typically is just a discu the, the point where we can ask for information to see how strong claims are or what next move you might want to make. And then you mentioned the PIP. The PIP is really performance improvement plan. And then the interrogatories is just part of that discovery process. So interrogatories itself is just a list of questions, written questions that you can propose to the other party so that you can see what information is, is there. Um, but this, I mean, this is so much great information. Um, obviously, myself as a, as a young lawyer, first lawyer in my family, um, first time ever running a law business without a mentor when I first got into it. There are a lot of lessons that I learned along the way, but I'm curious to know what lessons have you learned, not just in, in terms of being an employment attorney, but what have you learned about yourself? And what have you learned about Shakita Hall as the professional, period? <laughs> I love it. I love it. And so we do get locked in of what our identity of what we do, right? Um, on a daily basis. And so when it comes to what what have I learned personally, I learned that my faith is very much strong. Um, there's times that, as you know, as an entrepreneur, you are getting six figures slapped in your bank account day one, and, and on one day. The next day or even a month, two months, you have not seen any deposits going into your bank account, but nothing but uh, deductions. And so with that, um, there's no time that I take the time to say, God is punishing me or I hate God, anything like that. So it has built my character and my faith tremendously. Uh, what I have learned is that I am uh, someone with a great personality and it had to take another individual to tell me that. Most lawyers, um, and I'm going to call lawyers out, are not relatable, not down to earth. Some call us a little stiffy, but you know, I can walk in a room and I'm not one to jump out there and say I'm an attorney. Why? Because I don't want to hear the landlord tenant dispute <laughs> scenarios. I don't want to hear my baby mom, my baby dad. Can I do I have a lawsuit? Let me tell you this happened. So I'm just gonna play the girlfriend in the room. Like you wouldn't even know I'm an attorney unless someone my usually one of my cousins or someone is very excited to say, This is my cousin, she's an attorney type thing. Um, and they honestly think I am joke when I say I don't like that part because I honestly especially if I'm paying an entry fee to get in somewhere, I want to enjoy myself. Is there cocktails, whatever, past food, a nice networking opportunity, whatever situation, but a good time to let my hair down and get away from my day to day. I would love to do that. And so going into a room as an attorney, um, and it's great. I, I, I appreciate all the referrals and all the, <laughs> the accolades, everyone, that, uh, that speak very highly of me. I do appreciate it, but it's days when you just want to be Shakita. And that's exactly what I learned. I wanted this world so bad. I wanted this title so bad. But there is a little girl in me that just wants to be in the room, be herself, um, and let her personality shine. And if something sparks from there and that requires a connection later on that could help possibly lead to some legal services, then I'm open to it. Um, but ultimately, those are two main things. And then the challenges that I have seen 
<laughs> I don't know if you want to give me the start on that, but the main thing is, it's so funny. I um, did a program on entrepreneurship and for so long, I was talking about, um, I, I bootstrapped it. Um, my first couple of clients, cash, um, Z- I don't even know if Zell, Zell probably was around, I'm that old, <laughs> but Zell probably was around, but it was the idea of what type of payments where I knew could be allowed. So I go into start a bank account, but I knew nothing about building up that business credit. Um, and then when I did, it was a nice banker was like, you've been in business this long, you don't have a business credit card, let's get you a business credit card. And so the idea of bootstrapping, then when I did want to have the idea of going and try to get financing, Who's going to lend to a black female? Despite, you see the settlement checks coming in. You see this coming in. It's just the idea of this business and how long should it be sustained. Um, Those are one thing. And then lastly, uh, the idea of are you capable and competent of handling my affairs? You know, whatever situation may be. Um, And I had to learn that you have to feel confident in yourself in order for those to feel comfortable in buying from you. That's some good stuff. I laughed when you said um, you don't even want to introduce yourself as an attorney because I'm very strategic about when I pull that title out. You know, you know, sometimes it's like, okay, I'm about to rock this attorney title yes. <laughs> all day, every day in this particular room. But other ways I'm like, uh, like, what do you do? Um, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> that is 100 percent true. And you have to walk this life to truly understand it. Like, yeah. it's no, it's no shade. It's no, no, I yeah. just want to be me. Um, but you also, and I also learned last year, bringing into this year, it's about what rooms you're walking into, right? So if I'm walking into a room with people, um, it's full of attorneys or different professionals, and that's the point of the um, meet up and the event, then it's nothing wrong with that. But just going into a regular family event, we going out to meet with you and your girlfriend for a birthday dinner. I I don't need to be known as the attorney at the table because I'll come to enjoy the labs and whatever else is being offered. <laughs> That's my perspective. Exactly. And I think it, I think the issue is especially um, for women and an additional, especially for black women is the lack of boundaries that other people have for us. So it, it always kind of seem as though we have to be on work mode 24 seven to serve everybody else's needs without the care or wherewithal about our emotional, spiritual and physical health either. I and I think that's just part of the culture that's built into this country too. Um, you know, not to not to make excuses for people, but I think it's it's so well built into the fabric of this nation that at times I don't even think people recognize that that's what they're doing. Mm. I you can know, I can yeah. But the honest is on them. We're telling y'all <laughs> it's Women's History Month, and we are telling you right now you're doing it. You <laughs> are doing it. So. Take a look at yourself. Check yourself, right? Yes, I um, love that. So, no, this is really, really good. Um, if you It really is. And it's good to have someone um, who sits in that seat. Like you said, we're sisters in a law. So, and you're a married woman with a child. Um, so, you, you understand it. You understand it. I can appreciate that. This is definitely a great dialogue. Yeah, for sure. If there is any advice you can give to women, because one of the things you said is, you know, really growing your confidence. I know for me, I I believe I always embody a certain level of confidence. I mean, I'm a former athlete. So, you know, putting yourself in that position and just talking, like really talking to yourself, like you're about to do this, you're going to do this. Like there's a certain amount of confidence that has to just emulate from you for you to perform. But I know I struggle with confidence in a way that other people may not have been able to see. You know what I mean? Um, so over the years, I've really have worked on my confidence at at different levels. And as I continue to aspire and achieve at different levels, there's also another layer of confidence that has to emerge in order for me to show up in those spaces and those new spaces more powerfully and to still show up powerfully as myself, not as somebody else, but as myself. Um, I know women struggle with that. Mm-hmm. Women struggle, people, period, struggle with imposter syndrome, but especially women and women of color. What advice would you give them 
on how they can either develop or cultivate confidence or where can they start if they're even looking or recognizing that this is an issue that they have? Um, honestly, looking within yourself, because honestly, I didn't think it was actually a confidence problem for me for a long time until uh, being introduced into the world of coaching. And I just remember having conversations with my coach and she just snapped out one day like, why do you think like that? Who taught you that? Who made you feel less than that you make you want to think like that? Um, I, You know, and it it hit and I didn't take any offense, but it made me sit in there for a moment. Um, the limited beliefs that we have about ourselves. We know we want more. We know we desire more. And we know we were placed here to get more. We see the uh, the sayings all the time. You're going to be the... Um, what did it say? You're not going to be the borrower. You're going to be the this and this and that. The lender. The lender, yeah. not the borrower. You're going to be the head, not the tail. And we actually believe those things and that we should live a life in abundance and all that. And then, yeah, it's this fear. It's something that, okay, I'm this close to it and we talk ourselves back from it. And so um, I'm not an athlete, but I was, I was more so, I always tell people, I didn't do the physical stuff, but what I used to do, I did a lot of debate, uh, mediation, uh, peer mediation groups and things like that. I always had the desire to be an attorney. And so I used to do a lot of social clubs. And within that, um, I always... I just that was why I thought I never really had too many confidence problems because I was always the you know one in the room. But I did also have to sit with why was I the loudest person in the room? Was I the one who was seeking the most attention in the room? And why was that? Um, and so th with all that within building your confidence, you realize that it's something I need to work on. And there's something or some or someone who told me something some time ago that are making me behave this way. And so ultimately um, I would say, you know, start Googling confidence and what um, that looks like. And if there, if you can, you know, afford a coach, definitely start working with a coach that focus. And I did, I noticed this, I don't care. I did a social media <laughs> uh, mastermind that they teach you how to build up followers. And the first thing I noticed was they teach you about mindset. You have to drop those limited beliefs. You have to clean these cluttered spaces in your household. Then I go into a coaching uh, where they teach you this and they teach you that. And I notice all of them start with mindset. You have to clear your mind of the clutter and the thoughts and beliefs from where we come. Because a lot of times we do come from the first in the family to do this. And um, I'm definitely the first attorney in my family, um, the first to own a law firm, all that type of stuff. So with that, it's being comfortable going into the room because it's like, oh, she automatically this, she thinks she's better than us. Now, I want all more of you guys to come up so we can vacation more, you know? <laughs> I want to have more of my cousins on vacations and things like that. So it's not a, she thinks she's better than us. I just know I couldn't, leave, I couldn't leave this world without following the dream that I had so long. And that was to become an attorney. Um, and so going back to the answer to your question, just simply... Google what is confidence and what that looks like. And like I said, if you can afford to look into coaching. Yeah, no, that's really good. That is really, really good. Yeah. I mean, we talked about a lot of things um, and it's always important for me to bring diverse individuals onto this podcast because we don't all experience life the exact same way. And it's so important to receive different perspectives that aren't like ours. Like even with us being two black women born and raised in America, there's a there's a lot of differing perspectives even between us. Where did you grow up at? South side of Chicago. Okay. And I grew up in Florida. So right <laughs> there's already a cultural difference, right? In between of just those those uh location demographics. So it's so much that we can all learn from each other. And I think if we just put in a little bit more time and effort to see what people are all about, we could really build a more unified nation I and agree. communities. Um, and it's sad because, you know, just even thinking, saying, listening to what you recently said about, okay, no, I want my cousins to come. I'd be feeling the exact same way. But don't nobody come up here. <laughs> don't nobody travel, you know, with us. So, 
you know, sometimes, and as women, I, I know we've been the, the catalyst to as much major change as anyone could ever think of. Women has been at the center point of that. But it is, it's hard sometimes, and it's hardening, disheartening mm -hmm. to know that as a woman and as someone who sees a greater good, not in just this world, but in their own families and their own communities, to at times feel ostracized because you want more and want better for the people that you love. It is so, man, it's hard. It's hard to grapple with that. Um, and I know that that can have, that can play tricks on people's minds and on their confidence. You know, it can keep them stuck and in positions where maybe years before they would have had the wherewithal to just leave because they know that wouldn't have been the place for them. So there's so many different things that we have to consider about ourselves and why we decide to show up in certain spaces that aren't and were not created for us. I love that. Um, yeah. So I, I really appreciate you for mentioning that. It's important that we all, as women, take the time, take the time to really do that deep work. Look at you first, figure, figure out why you respond the way that you do. Why do you you know, have a certain reaction in certain rooms, but not others, you know, um, what are you unhappy about? Yes. And do you have the power to change it? Because I will bet that you do, but there's going to be something else that you're going to have to change, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, and that might also have a ripple effect to the fact that there might be people that you also lose, but at the end of the day, you have permission to choose you. And I think that is the biggest the biggest lesson of today is that you really have the power to choose you. I love that. Yeah. Love that. yeah. So thank you so much for coming on this podcast. I would love for people to follow you. So please tell us where people can interact with you at on social website, whatever, just throw it <laughs> at us. <laughs> My main website is ShakitaHallJackson.com, and that is hyphenated, as you see displayed here. Shakita, um, just like the banana, Hall-Jackson.com, um, and it links you to all my wonderful businesses that I've been working so hard on, my law firm, my apparel line, and also my speaking and consulting um, page. And then on IG and Facebook is Blow the Whistle Law. Well, blow the whistle law. There is a blow the whistle. So make sure you have the word law in there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And listen, guys, I'm going to give you this reminder again. Early bird registration for NIL Combine live event is open. Make sure you tell your friend, tell your parents, your 80s, your coaches, whomever you consider to be your advocate, your athlete advocate. Make sure you get in the room. NIL Combine is the number one premier event for name, image, and likeness, and we are excited to serve you. But the only way you get served is by taking action to be there. So go and RSVP right now at bit.ly forward slash NIL Combine 2023. That's bit.ly forward slash NIL Combine 2023. Again, that's bit.ly forward slash NIL Combine. 2023. And make sure that it's in all caps. I'm Savannah DeBrow's protector of athletes. It's always my pleasure to come on to motivate, support, and guide you to your very next level. Until next time, guys, I'll see you later. Ciao. Joining us this week on What Are You Sporting About? podcast. Make sure to visit our website, prosportlawyer.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever your favorite platform is so you'll never miss a show. And while you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes or iHeartRadio. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. If you like the show, you might want to check out our book, What Are You Sporting About? Attorney Savania DeBarros is available for private consulting at SL debarros.com and remember we're here to educate support and guide you in your journey to success because we're all sporting about something